Hey guys, it's Loman02. I want to do a quick deck tech on this 100 card singleton or Highlander lands deck that I've been working on. Um, and, you know, I don't know how great the deck is. I'm trying to build it as well as it can be built. Uh, but it is extremely fun. It's very sophisticated. The gameplay is very puzzle box oriented. But what it does play out a lot like is um, Legacy Lands. Um, not obviously as, um, as streamlined as that because we don't have four of copies, but it does have some actual. Uh, actually probably a higher power level on certain draws due to the fact that it has some vintage cards available to it. So I'm going to skip the 28 here. This is just a mana base with tons of fetches and maybe some standouts like, you know, uh, Mystic Confluence and City of Brass. reason we run those is a five-color deck. Um, so it splashes white for Enlightened Tutor. And it also has Engineer Explosives, which being able to get to 5 with it is not irrelevant. What does this deck lose to? Probably Blood Moon, uh, but it does have some answers in the main deck to it. And what I'd like to cover is how the deck actually runs. So pile number 4, I got 4, but this pile that has 4 above it right here is the actual engine of the deck. Um, the engine itself really does not require Life from the Loam, although it is preferred. Uh, but once you get these 3 cards online... Um, if you're on the most creative sort, you can tell that you can have infinite mana and infinite life. Um, what that means is you can generally, with the fetch lands, fleece every single land out of your deck, um, gain arbitrarily infinite life, and stay alive forever. Um, but at the end of the day, how you actually win um, is going to be through this pile that says 6 right here that I'm highlighting. That has mana vortex, punishing fire, uh, grove of the burn well willows for punishing fire, which with the engine itself is... Um, is a net life uh, neutral loss for you as the, the uh, player of it, and for your opponent, it's a net loss of one life every time, but you can loop it infinitely uh, once you have the engine turned on. Barbarian Ring is probably the least sophisticated uh, win con, but probably one of the easier ones to get online, as well as Dark Depth. So I've actually yet to kill with Molten Vortex. Um, typically speaking, this deck is either going to kill with Dark Depth's Thespian Stage combo, because it's very easy to get, and we'll kind of show you some of the ways we get into that, um, and Barbarian Ring, because this deck, because of the Loam Engine, which is one of the, the things that it generally almost always wants to have online, probably before even the engine itself, the uh, the complete engine of Crucible, Zurin, Orb, and Fastbond, um, it's very easy to ditch a lot of cards, because you're dredging, and getting lands back is something that the deck already wants to do with Life from the Loam. So, to kind of step back a bit, let me cover each of these cards if you're not familiar with them. So, Crucible of Worlds, I think most folks will know. It just says you may play land cards from your graveyard. Obviously, it's very good with fetch lands. And when you have lands that start doing some other things, which we'll cover in the further piles over there in a bit, um, they become even better. Especially when you're utilizing your lands, which this deck is, uh, is draw engines, is disruption, uh, removal, and basically interaction in a lot of ways. Uh, Zurin Orb, very old card, uh, printed in Ice Age, I want to say. Um, sacrifice a land, gain two life. Um, so, once you have Fast Bond in play, which says you can play any number of lands on each of your turns, uh, whenever you play a land after the first one, take a damage. Um, so, there are some interesting combos with this card in this deck. One, if you have this entire engine online, you're only losing one life for every two life gain when you sacrifice it. You can bring a land back and make more mana with it, which gives you an, uh, an arbitrarily infinite amount of mana and an arbitrarily infinite amount of life, which means you know you could just fireball them out if that, that's what you had in the deck. Obviously, we don't we didn't go that way um, with the deck. Uh, I think having like a, a cheesy fireball in here is at least interesting, but I don't think I would want to go that route. One of the ways I may go if I wanted to go the fireball route would actually be Conflagrate, which I believe if the board will move over is actually still sitting in here. Um, Conflagrate is interesting because if you continue to use the infinite mana generation of the loop, um, you can basically just pick up every land card in your in your deck, put it in your hand with life from the loam, um, and then you know pay red red, discard all the lands in your deck, and fireball them out, and that can be cast from the graveyard, uh, which means that dredging it or ditching it in the yard is not a big deal. Uh, but I haven't gone that route. It's just something I've been like experimenting with. Um, so that's how the deck wins, um, and you know that's how it generally works. Some cool combos with Fast Bond as well. Um, very old card. You see it in Legacy Lands, Glacial Chasm. Um, if you have this in play, it actually means you can just utilize Life or Correction Fast Bond indefinitely without taking any damage from it. Because Fast Bond was written in an older time. It was in the initial release of Magic, where it says you don't lose life, but you just take a damage. So because Glacial Chasm says prevent all damage that will be dealt to you, you can just do this infinitely. Now keep in mind that if you're using Fetch Lands to accrue infinite value off Crucible, you're paying one life on those because they were printed in a newer time under probably a more discerning um, design or more discerning eye for design um, and fair play of cards. 
Um, so you're still going to lose life when you're when you're doing that. Or if you're putting shock lands into play like Blood Crypt, that's a pay two life effect as well. Um, so that's the engine. What you have here, you know, in this first pile of non-lands, exploration, mox diamond, just some acceleration. Um, you know, I, I tend to find that if you're able to get out there early, um, and often it tends to be better for you uh, because the deck is not extremely fast. Although, I will say this, the deck has a very high upside power level. Um, this is probably one of the few decks in a 100-card format that can actually win on turn one. Now, given that's a very low probability draw, um, extremely low, but it can. Um, it's a possibility. Um, so this ramp tends to allow you to kind of get out in front uh, early because this deck is, is very, um, you know, typically speaking, is going to play out more like a control deck. It, it is a control deck. Um, it does have fast combo wins that it can that it can enact, uh, but typically speaking, it's going to play a long control game until it can finally find and assemble all the pieces it needs to just go infinite and win that way. Uh, Raven's Cry, you know, with Life from the Loam, this basically says delete anyone's hand if they're trying to hold cards and play a permission fight. You'll just beat them on that. Um, the rest of this, you know, is one for one answers. So and some card draw and filtration. So ponder, preordain, um, brainstorm. Where are you at, buddy? Huh? Our brainstorm appears to be missing. Well, maybe we took it out of the... No, it got caught up over here. There it is. I was going to say, Brainstorm's definitely in this deck. <laughs> um, so, one for one card draw slash filtration, and then one for one answers all the way down, um, including Fatal Push, uh, Ghastly Demise, uh, Pierce the Snare. This next pile, I've kind of left just uh, the other one for one answers. Um, although, actually, let's move Oath over here. So, this is a one creature deck. Um, but I think that's odd, and the one creature is uh, Primeval Titan. You may think that's odd to have Oath of Druids in a deck like this, but actually Oath is dual purpose. It's kind of actually like a draw seven in a lot of ways. Um, and the way, reason I say that is because you, know, you have effects like Regrowth, Nostalgic Dreams, which can get you a literal draw seven, but because even if we have the Primeval Titan in play, depending on what the board state is and if we've accomplished the engine, because if we have the engine, we don't really need to do anything else, um... We can utilize Oath to ditch our whole library and then have our engine, all our components, all our land components that we need, um, all our spell lands, to utilize the engine indefinitely to win the game. Um, and like I said, it's typically going to be Barbarian Ring, especially if you're going that route. You can also randomly find a Titan, which is cool. Um, Titan's pretty big, and realistically, he's just a secondary hour of promise because we generally figure that our opponent's going to remove this guy after we get the two lands that we need with it. The rest of this is one-for-one one answers and or search for his Kanta, which I think is also has some high synergy, high upside synergy with the deck because you want to ditch cards in your graveyard pretty early, pretty often, and just filter out your draw to get it when you need. Um, the rest of it is just intended to stay alive during the early game and or buy time or just um, you know out-tempo your opponent. Um, this is the engine pile, as we discussed. This is the mass removal pile. So this deck is going to, generally speaking, take a beating in the early game, so you need to have a lot of cards to buy time. Um, Damnation, Toxic Deluge, Radiant Flames, um, Maelstrom Pulse, um, Pernicious Deed, Engineered Explosives, and Firestorm. Engineered Explosives is probably one of the more powerful effects in the deck, um, just due to the fact that we have Academy Runes and the fact that we can cast, uh, we can utilize mana of all five colors very reliably in this deck uh, makes it very powerful. Firestorm also, I think, was worth a nod and inclusion in this. It doesn't have as much synergy as perhaps like a reanimator build where you want to ditch cards to just to reanimate them. Um, however, when you're utilizing Life in the Loam, uh, cards like Firestorm um, tend to be a lot more powerful. That's also why you'll see draw engines like Bizarre Baghdad in this deck uh, because, typically speaking, if you have Life in the Loam done on a certain turn, um, you know, Ditching three cards to draw two real cards, like ditching three land cards to draw two real cards, is actually not a bad deal. And Bazaar can actually also protect the life from the loam from um, graveyard uh, graveyard uh, hosers or you know graveyard disablers. Um, so mass removal definitely very important. This next pile of fifteen is the tutor package, and I guess Oath could kind of go in here, kind of go in the draw package. I look at it as a, as a little bit of both. Our promise starting at the our correction. Primeval Titan starting at the highest converted mana cost. Everyone knows loves this card. It's just a powerful card, and because this deck is winning with lands, uh, having an additional land tutor, even if it is six mana, I think is worth it. Um, and it could randomly win on its own, but I don't think I've ever won with it in this deck. Um, our promise just finds two lands in a deck that has plenty of two land combos um, to include the Dark Depths, Thespian Stage combo, you know, Grove if you have Punishing Fire. Um, and or any of the other like disruptive lands that you may need, which we'll cover the, the, the spell land package here in a minute. Uh, but this is a very powerful card. You'll never get a 2-2 off of it, but even for 5 mana, this is a powerful enough effect that we want it. Insidious Dreams. So much like Firestorm, Insidious Dreams is a beast in this deck. Um, when you have Life from the Loam, you know, 
ditching two to three land cards to cast this thing on their end step because it is an instant um, to stack your library is awesome because typically speaking you're only going to need one or two cards to just to find a win con or if you're sharp you know you can find something like wheel of fortune and then stack like one to two remaining combo pieces you need and then insidious dreams you know draw into on their end step draw into wheel of fortune wheel your hand which should be pretty depleted at that point and draw into two two of the three components required for the engine so i think the card's extremely powerful intuition also great in this style of deck um you know it generally tends to get life in the loan packages, whether that be a Raven's Crime, Wasteland, Life in the Loan Package, or a Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, Life in the Loan Package. Um, it's extremely good. And I've, I've had some other cases where there's other lands that I've wanted, and if you have Loam, Loam with any two lands, it's going to give you those two lands, right? So it's basically a draw three. It's an Ancestral Recall for um, for three mana, which is good enough. Well, it's actually better than that. It's like an Ancestral Recall for specific cards, but with your choice out of your, your deck, essentially, in this style of deck. Realms and Charters. So this is a bizarre card. I think it's very sweet, and um, I always kind of want to find a home for it because I think the card is, like, extremely powerful. Um, it's under-costed Gifts Ungiven um, that, you know, allows you to find four lands, and your uh, opponent chooses which of those two um, go to your graveyard, which and the rest go into your hand. Um, so, you know, that said, it's instant speed as well for three mana, which means that you can find basically four lands that you want. If you have Life in the Loma Crucible, that means you just find four of the best lands in your deck, which we'll get to in a minute. You know, our lands are what actually win us the game. So, extremely powerful card. Sylvan Scrying, just, you know, perfect selection. It's basically Demonic Tutor in this deck. Well, it's, it's close to Demonic Tutor in this deck. Um, for about, you know, 50% of the deck is Demonic Tutor. Shred Memory. Um, well, this card's twofold. One, it's a transmute effect that can find, you know, any of the two drops. Generally, what I find that it finds is probably Demonic Tutor. Um, I have used it to find other things as well, um, to include, like, Regrowth or Nostalgic Dreams um, or Life in the Loam. So, actually, I'm sorry, Demonic Tutor or Life in the Loam are, like, generally the two biggest ones. Those, those are about 50-50 each. Um, but after that, it's generally, like, Regrowth or Nostalgic Dreams in case, you know, we've already got the Loam engine online and we've binned cards that we need. Um, we can use the Nostalgic Dreams or Regrowth to get them back. Um, Bundle of Mixture. Same thing. You know, this is Disruption, um, as is the Shred Memory, and it's also just a way to counter, you know, a spell if, if you're getting disrupted by your opponent. Uh, typically speaking, it's going to find Loam or any of the other cards we just talked about when talking about Shred Memory. Demonic Tutor, Granddaddy of All Tutors, not much to be said there. Crop Rotation. This card is Beast, so it allows you to generally win a close to instant speed, so you can instant speed uh, Dark Depths into play and, you know, convert a Thespian Stage into a zero um, counter uh, Dark Depths and have a Merit Age. Or you can Crop Rotation something into, you know, the card we previously talked about, uh, Glacial Chasm or Tabernacle um, or Academy Runes. Academy Runes is especially relevant because it finds two of the pieces of your, or it allows you to get back two of the pieces of your engine. Um, you know, basically the only card you cannot get back, with the exception of utilizing Regrowth, Nostalgia Dreams, or Time Twistering your deck back together, is going to be Fast Bond. So the deck runs, you know, these other effects like Time Twister, Nostalgic Dreams, and Regrowth uh, to rebuy the Fast Bond if necessary. Um, and Tomb. And Tomb is basically a one mana instant speed uh, tutor for Life in the Loam, which makes it extremely good because Loam is kind of the backbone of the deck. Uh, personal tutor uh, finds any sorcery can find loam um, can find um, you know demonic tutor uh, can find regrowth can find a lot of things uh, can find time twister or wheel of fortune as well uh, but very powerful um, even if it is sorcery speed because we have you know um, not only some draw cards to get into them but we also have a lot of lands that are basically the draw engine of the deck. So these lands right here combine with Loam to turn themselves, to turn lands that you get back with Loam into real cards. Mystical Tutor, uh, probably the most busted tutor in the deck. Um, it and Demonic Tutor are close, although I would say that Realms Uncharted and Insidious Dreams have very high upside power level in this deck, um, just due to the, the high synergy of the cards with what we're doing. But Mystical Tutor and Demonic Tutor are probably the two most powerful, and Tomb's close to. Enlightened Tutor next. Enlightened Tutor does find the Fast Bond or finds either um, Crucible, Zurin Orb, or Engineered Explosives. Teleria West. Um, this is also a tutor effect. Um, it allows you to, one, find any land you may need or find Zurin Orb, one of the parts of the combo, the actual engine itself. Um, engineered Explosives, which can buy you a ton of time, especially if it's combined with Academy Runes, or it can find, you know, like the Explosives and then get Life and Loamed back to find Academy Runes to just recurse Explosives over and over again against permanent heavy decks. 
Uh, Oath of Druids, we already talked about, can only find one target in the whole deck, but the extra, the ability of, of milling uh, your library is actually beneficial in this style of deck because we want to gain access uh, through Loam and Infinite Mana and Infinite Life, um, access to all of our spell lands, which can kill our opponent. The next part here, these are kind of like the oops cards, so like Nostalgic Dreams and Regrowth. Um, both allow you to get back, you know, any component that you may not be able to get back. Generally speaking, they're just here to get back Fast Bond. Although, I've used them to get back, like, Demonic Tutor, just to find the Fast Bond uh, rapidly. Um, so, you know, they both have some high upside power. And again, Nostalgic Dreams is another Dream Cycle card, like Firestorm, Insidious Dreams. Nostalgic Dreams requires of you to discard X cards to return X cards from your graveyard. Because you're going to be using Loam in this deck to accrue a large hand size of generally cards that you don't per se need or you can get back later, Nostalgic Dreams can turn into real cards, which, combining that with Dredge, the Dredge effect of Life from Loam, you'll be able to get back a lot of, you know, different and unique cards, and as you can see, a lot of cards that can get after other cards in the deck. So despite this being essentially a three-card engine, I mean, it can generally work on any, th or I'm sorry, it can work on Crucible, uh, Fast Bond, Loam, or, um, or Loam, Fast Bond, Zurin Orb. You know, any three of them generally tends to work well enough together. And Loam and Crucible are good enough on their own that I think, you know, they're they're fine. Fast Bond's not great generally on its own, but it's okay. And Zurin Orb can just keep you alive for a long time until you can find what you need to do. But the two weakest cards of this bunch are definitely Zurin Orb and Fast Bond as far as their singular their singular power outside of being enabled. Uh, once they're enabled, you know, their power level is through the roof. It's infinite. Um... And then you have Wheel of Fortune and Time Twister. Time Twister, I'm a little low to play in the deck, uh, because typically speaking, like I said, we want to build up our graveyard, so Wheel of Fortune is strictly better in this deck. However, you know, there are times when maybe you've exhausted your resources, um, and you need to find the Fast Bond just to win the game, and it's in your graveyard, and you have no other way to get it, so you Twister just to see if you can get into it, especially if you're on a high permanent count board where you've played out a ton of lands and developed your board. Again, the, the six uh, pile right here is just the win conditions of the deck. I think Molten Vortex will get cut. I do like the card as an alternate win con, but I have yet to use it. Um, you know, it has the same uh, misfortune of being like Fast Bond in that, you know, you can ditch it very easily with Dredge, and there's not a lot of ways to get it back outside of Regrowth or Nostalgic Dreams or Twister. Um, but it's really not the highest upside win con. It's fine. Um, and I don't know. I, I may cut it, though, just to, to have, like, you know, less dead weight, because this card, kind of on its own, without the Loam Engine, is not that great. Alright, so, the Spell Lands. Um, okay, actually, Bizarre should go over here. So, one pile is the Draw Engines, the other pile is the Spell Lands. Bazooka Bog uh, beats the Mirror, um, helps, you know, keep you alive against Reanimator decks. Generally, pretty easy to find lands in this deck, so if you find this thing, you can use it. And you can reuse it, too. Once you have the Engine online, um, you can wasteland your own Bajuka Bog, get it back, and continue to do it again and again. Cabal Pit, a uh, very strong card. And actually, I'm going to be showing you a, a set of games that I play with this deck and use this thing to kill a creature. Uh, being able to kill creatures uh, with your lands after you get to seven cards in your graveyard or threshold uh, was very powerful, um, especially against like rush style strategies or like weenie decks. Um, I lied. This actually needs to go over here, too. So that's another draw card. Ghost Quarter. Um, so if you have the engine online, this means you can remove... You can strip mine every single land inside an opponent's deck. You can basically cast Mana Severance if they choose to continue to play basic lands, uh, which is very powerful. Glacial Chasm. Uh, allows you to stay alive basically forever. Once the engine's online, they're not going to be able to damage you outside of throwing Instant Speed Burn at you um, when you sacrifice this thing during your upkeep. But once you replay it with the engine online, then you know they go back into lockdown and you can't be damaged anymore. Maze of Ith buys tons of time um, against decks that rely on like generally like decent-sized threats. It's very good. Tabernacle also buys a ton of tempo and time. Does not actually tap for mana itself, which sucks, but you know it does buy you a ton of time against horizontal grow-style decks. Um, Wasteland, um, similar to Ghost Quarter, it can you know strip mine all of their their or it can wasteland all of their uh, non-basics. Academy Runes gets us back two of the uh, three components of our uh, our three-card combo or three-card engine set. And then this last pile here is just all draw engine. Um, so Bizarre Baghdad works similarly to like you know Firestorm and Insidious Dreams in the fact that you're going to have more cards than you need, and discarding land cards that you can get back um, is generally good to convert them into real spells out of the deck because you are running 50 and you want to you want to be able to get through your land cards to get into actual spells at certain points in the game. Uh, Fetid Pools, Lonely Sandbar, Horizon Canopy, Scattergrove, Sheltered Thicket, Tranquil Thicket, and Cephalid Coliseum are all. Um, 
uh, other varieties of draw. And actually, I do actually like Cephalid Coliseum and Horizon Canopy is better as draw engines once you have the engine online than uh, Bazaar of Baghdad, because Bazaar of Baghdad actually taps um, to do it, whereas the other two sacrifice, um, which means when you can play infinite lands, you can just get them back and continue to do it. Now, with Bazaar of Baghdad, you could, you know, use it, wasteland it, bring it back from the graveyard, and continue to do that and loop through your whole deck with Life in the Loam. Um, until you get to your win con in that case, which would likely be Barbarian Ring. Uh, but typically speaking, the ones that I like the best are Horizon Canopy first, and then uh, Cephalid Coliseum. Horizon Canopy just says, hey, pay one, sack it. You're probably going to sack another land, gain some life back, replay this thing, sack it again, and just draw your whole deck. You will draw your whole deck because you have infinite life, infinite mana, um, and once you have all the cards that remain, you'll either find you know, like a Molten Vortex, a you know, Punishing Fire, or a Barb Ring just to, to burn them out. Uh, but that's the deck. So I'm going to go into a quick game set right now. The the board over there is a maybe board right now. I have not um, I have not fleshed that out. But I played against player Sung, and this first game is interesting. And actually, it was one of the more fun games I played. And I always play fun games against Sung. Um, she is playing a white aggro deck. We are playing this hinky weird lands deck. So this hand is is fine. Um, it's not great, but it's not terrible either. It, it can buy a lot of time with the spells it has available in it. So she casts Stoneforge Mystic. We go ahead and obviously snare this. I don't want her to get a Batter Skull or a bunch of game-breaking cards with it um, that are going to clock me faster than I can set up. Because this hand's not fast, just has a bunch of time available to it. See, Pygon Bishop, I just memory lapse this because I don't, you know, I'm buying time again. Um, Academy Runes is not a bad draw, so if I ever get my Loam Engine online, I'll be able to kind of draw into what I need. Um, I just cycle here. Because, again, we have tons of lands, and I kind of just want to get through them and find relevant spells. I go ahead and get rid of that because it is a card engine, and I don't want to, you know, have her draw billions of cards. Thalia is interesting. I don't need to pop that fetch land, so I just play it out tapped regardless. I mean, I could have played it out untapped, I suppose. It's actually a slightly better play, but eh. doesn't matter all that much. She plays a sword out. I'm going to go ahead and pass it here because I have Cabal Pit. I will sack the Cabal Pit here because I don't need this much mana to really win the game. Um, or rather, I don't, you know, once I have my engine online, I will not need, it won't, I'll have infinite mana, it's, you know, I can use it here and it's fine. She plays a secondary threat after I kill her other threat. I do go ahead and leave the diamond in play, I Radiant Flames to kill this, because again, I'm just buying time. And she's a smart enough player that I know she's probably not going to dump her hand if she has more threats in there, because she, she's going to play around mass removal. She goes ahead and equips this up. Um, I'm going to take four. Take of note, though, like that we're at turn eight in the game, and I have yet to be hit by one of her threats. But I am at ten life, so I've paid pretty dearly for uh, my my greedy mana base and my greedy spells. We find fast bond. It's not a great draw here, but you know it's good to get it out of the way because you you are going to need it at some point. She plays a threat, so I know hey I'm in trouble at this point because I don't have an answer to this threat, which is going to kill me very fast. I draw very well into Teleria, Teleria West. Now I screw up here. I do get the Maze of Vith. What I should have gotten is Engineered Explosives because I already have the Academy Runes in play, which means that I could have uh, pretty much locked her out of the game with the Engineered Explosives. Although if she plays a one drop, I'm going to be loath to pop Explosives because I really don't want to get rid of the Fast Bond. Um, I go ahead and cast this on end step. I could have done it during main. I just don't want her to have... Um, I don't want her to draw into like something like... Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the card's name. Like Any protection spell um, would be very bad for me. Draw another land. Leave it in hand here. She's obviously drawing more lands than she requires, um, which stinks. I don't know how many she has. Probably 34. So that's a fairly... like Eight lands in the top... 20. I guess it's not horrible, horrible. Alright, so swords are fine by me. Um, they're not really a big threat because um, she only has one threat, and Maze is going to keep that in check. I do play out this fetch land, just pass it back, um, because if I don't have to take damage from Fast Bond, I'd rather not, especially at this point where I really can't regain life. I believe she plays a Kitchen Finks here. Um, we allow this to resolve. Uh, more proper line of play by us probably would have been just to burn it off with Punishing Fire here and then Bazooka Bog on our turn. I, I play the Bazooka Bog out, uh, get her graveyard, pop this thing with the fiery, or correction, Punishing Fire. Although on her side, she she definitely misplayed as well. She should have equipped the Sword of Fire and Ice um, to that threat so that it makes it harder to kill if I have anything. Um... Because even Cabal Pit there is kind of problematic. If I'm able to get life in the loam or I have something like that, I draw. 
So she has a Shafet Dunes, which is a cool card, but is not doing much for her here. I draw into more land, just play my other fetch land out. I could start thinning, but I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't think it, it makes sense to thin. I think, because we have Brainstorm in the deck, and, or in, I know Jace's not in the deck, but we do have Brainstorm. I have a lot of tutors, so there's a possibility we want to shuffle at some point in time. So she has two threats now. We draw very well and draw a Preordain here, which is great. I actually keep both. Like, the counter spell is not phenomenal, but it's probably better than a random draw in my deck. And it allows me to buy more time. So I'm just hanging on. That's all I'm doing. I want to keep this land in hand just in case I draw a Firestorm or, like, an Insidious Dreams or um, uh, the Green Dreams. I always forget the name of that card. Nauseous Dreams or something. I forget. All right. I love this resolve because one threat is not a problem. It's the second threat that I need to counter. If she plays a Planeswalker, I'll feel pretty sick if I allow that to happen. I do have to counter this because I don't have an answer to a secondary threat uh, plus the two swords. So she's going to double equip her angel, which can still do absolutely nothing through the maze of Ith. Draw a firestorm here. That's, you know, a lukewarm at best draw. Um, we have kept the land in our hands, so I mean, you know, if we need to kill some creatures, firestorm can probably do that to most of her creatures. Um, Draw a mana leak, dead at this point, but it does pitch very well to uh, Firestorm, so most of her creatures are probably going to have two toughness. Some of them will likely have more, but not many of them, and, um, you know, having that to pitch is nice. So we finally get a really good draw here in the form of Enlightened Tutor, which is going to allow us to fix our mistake of earlier getting the um, Maze of Ith. So she plays a 4-drop Gisela out, which she has a Caracas, which means that thing is essentially protected. But what I'm going to do is fix my mistake from earlier and lighten Tutor for Engineered Explosives. I will likely cast it out for four here to um, kill her Restoration Angel and force her to return her four drop into hand, her four drop legend. I'm going to do this of note on her upkeep because I want to force inefficiency out of her mana. It's not a, gr it's not a huge upside play, but it is slight upside. So we go ahead and blow this up. She Caracuses as expected, but loses her other threat. And I really don't mind if she has Gisela because, you know, she can only play that one card every turn and she has to leave Caracas up. Um, so by forcing her to do it on her turn, if she tries to replay it here, I'll just blow it up. I do personal tutor at this point in time for Life from the Loam, um, which is basically game. She plays the Gisela, but no other threats. Uh, double equips it with swords. Keep in mind, we're on turn 24 of her turn, and she has yet to touch us with any creature, which is, I don't know, it's it's pretty, that's something to be said about that. We did get lucky in this game. We had some good draw steps in certain parts, um, and she obviously drew a lot of lands herself. We do Teleria West for Glacial Chasm. She goes ahead and concedes here. She sees the writing on the wall. Um, so... The, the problem is this, like, she, she knows how uh, my deck's going to work, um, you know, because I've talked to her about what it does and kind of, like, my excitement about this design. And she's even tried to build land decks um, in 100 card. The way this is going to work is now I take zero damage from utilizing Fast Bond uh, to play, play lands, right? Because I have Glacial Chasm in play. So I'm going to sack a land, um, probably the tapped land, one of these tapped lands. And then I'm going to Lonely Sandbar back into Life in the Loam, and then I'm going to continue to get back to Laria West and uh, Lonely Sandbar and other lands. Um, and I will transmute, after I've done that, uh, to Laria West into Zurin Orb, which will allow me to go infinite um, on life and on mana uh, from this position. And on cards, because I have Lonely Sandbar. So... She's cool about it and doesn't force me to show her that because what I would eventually do with this loop is I would Teleria... I would do this in the exact sequence. I would get the Glacial Chasm first, get the uh, Zurin Orb, then I would start transmuting Teleria West into um, Cycling Lands. Um, and after I'd found those, I would just continually loop back with Life in the Loam, the Cycling Lands, and just draw my whole deck um, while sacrificing the mana that I need to gain the life from uh, Zurin Orb. Um if I need to. So that's how the deck works, and I could also just, you know, fetch fetch all the lands out of my deck, you know, with uh, Verdant Catacombs and, um, and Scalding Tarn that are in there right now. So we, uh, we establish Infinite um, at turn 24, or at least Inevitability of Infinite at turn 24, and she goes ahead and concedes it there. So 24 turn game against White Weenie with a deck that runs one creature, and we did not get hit by an attacker one time, which... 
is pretty cool. And this game was at least sweet. It was at least very wacky and cool and kind of like it was a fun game to play. I think there were some better lines I could have taken in it, but I kind of wanted to display how and what the deck does to, to, to win. And this is what it does. The second game displays a completely different side of the deck, which is the fast side of it, like the non-controlling side, just the speed. Um, this hand, you know, has promise because of intuition, which is, generally speaking, kind of like an auto-win, especially when I have Raven's Crime in hand. The only downside to this hand is, is that it does not have a uh, great untapped blue mana source. I Raven's Crime turn once my, my poor opponent, Soong, has mulligan to five cards, and I think it makes sense just to hit the gas out of her hand. I go ahead and get rid of the, the Tabernacle because even if she casts a creature here, I'm not hugely worried about it because I have... Uh, I have this uh, intuition. I do play out my tap blue source, leaving up Miscalc against the Macaeus the Lunark, which is a 1-1 one -to -one right now. It's a 1-1, one -one, but it has some upside. She plays this out, which is actually very good with Macaeus, but I say no to it. Um, <clears throat> and then we go ahead this next turn, play out our land, uh, go ahead and force her to discard her last card, which I believe is Kitchen Finks, and then tell her to go. I could have intuitioned on my turn, but I'd rather her like not know what I'm up to, not know like you know if she has something else like this. Like I know she has it now. It's not like you know um, I don't know like something that could blow me out. She goes ahead and concedes there because she knows the writing's on the wall. I'm gonna get in this situation uh, Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, and Loam. And with that, plus Raven's Crime, the game is over. Um, she's not going to be able to hold cards in her hand, and she's going to be staring down a 2020 that, even if she does manage to kill with Swords to Plowshares or Path to Exile, I will get back inevitably and slowly. Um, another thing I could have done is just gone for like some Disruption Lands, but Hour of Promise, because I, I guess what I meant is I could have gone for some Disruption cards, because Hour of Promise could get me the combo as well on the following turn. But I'd probably just go as fast as I can here and just get both those cards. Um, with Loam, just so I can win. Uh, but that's the fast side of the deck. I mean, you know, it's a, basically a turn turn 5-6 kill. Uh, turn, this is a turn 5 kill. Um, well, wait, no, it would have been a turn 6 kill, because this, my next turn would have been my turn 5. Would I have one of them play? Or it would have been 7. It's not extremely fast, but it shows you that the, the card does or the deck does have combo outs to to rapidly win and punish. And this could have been faster if we'd taken a separate line that did not involve Ravens criming my opponent, um, and I had played out the Lonely Sandbar on the first turn. Uh, we could have uh, expedited this process probably by turn, uh, but I think it was still smart to Ravens crime them, given that they'd mulligan to five. Um, I think that was probably the right line because it just reduces their resources that much more. Um, and, you know, for us, discarding lands is not really a bad thing because eventually this will happen when we get intuition and we'll just loam them to death. So, this is 100 card lands. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I wanted to share it with you because I think the deck's very cool and I put a decent bit of time into kind of, you know, developing it. And um, I think it's, you know, better than you'd think. It's probably a tier two deck. Um, you know, could it win a tournament? Possibly. What is it good against control? Not bad against mid range. Uh, this version's tuned to beat um, aggro. Where does it struggle, um, you know, against extreme speed decks? Like, red deck wins, I think, would be a problem matchup for it. Um, and then, like, blue-red moon. Like, any deck that's running blood moon back to basics, like, is probably just going to wreck it because it doesn't even run basics in it. Um, it's, you know, banking on using its uh, its permission and or its, um, you know, its abrupt decays and whatnot to deal with that. And, you know, if you get had, you get had. Um, you know, and that's that's just that, you know. But the deck is very cool. I think um, put a lot of time into it. I hope you guys enjoy this video. And uh, if this is a deck that interests you, you pick it up and give it a try. It's uh, it's a little more complicated than you'd think just first looking at it because uh, it has a lot of singular options that are you know um, that are extremely decision intensive. You know, but then again, any deck that has essentially 15 tutors, excluding the fetch lands, is bound to have a lot of decisions to be made. So I hope you guys enjoy this video and take care now.